12 rules for life. Well, 12 rules for whose life? Imagine a man living in 90s. He is in his mid 40s and is an academic, an intellectual and a person of philosophical spirit. He devotes most of his time to studies and is immersed in his work. There's nothing outstanding about his intellectual endeavors, being pretty regular but an insightful person. One thing to consider though is that he is much loved and admired by his students, friends and acquaintances, due to his remarkably good character and bright mind. But there's one thing, he always conceals the fact that he is an atheist. He refuses to reveal it to his younger brother and sister and to his students and mostly avoids speaking about it in most social circumstances. The reason for his decision or disposition, if you will, do not lie in surrounding social cultural conditions where one would jeopardize his reputation or frustrate people around him. Quite the contrary, he is very much free to express his stance on the matter of God. And now I'd like to ask you a question. Given that his decision was not motivated by some deep psychological issues, how would you interpret it? Is it a form of intellectual arrogance? Is his choice unethical? Is he a liar? Is that an example of overcaring where you show mercy and spare people from the truth, even though people around you are not that religious anyway? And lastly, to pose a more general question, what are your thoughts on such behavior? Does it irritate you that one may grant himself the right to such intellectual arrogance? Now, in order to clarify this hazy opening, we must look at Spengler's definition of socialism. In general, the term socialism refers to a political position on social justice and economic concerns. As a result, this term is often used as a synonym for modern leftism which is a set of principles regarding progressive taxation, government regulations, social justice, foreign policy, healthcare, and so on. Spengler now gives the term socialism a far larger meaning and reintroduces this concept to explain the a priori ethical temperament or foundational psychological stance, if you will, of the Western ethos. Thus, Spengler takes socialism to be a morale and one of the primary world feeling of a Western mind, regardless of one's political ideology. Hence, according to Spengler, every Westerner, conservative, capitalist, anarchist, communist, Jesuit, evangelist, Catholic, existentialist, Darwinist, neo-spiritualist, you name it, is a socialist. As a matter of fact, Spengler contends that a person of Western civilization from the 19th century onwards is incapable of thinking otherwise. In the same way German philosopher Immanuel Kant takes a priori intuition forms of space and time to be the necessary preconditions of having any form of experience, Spengler regards socialism to be an a priori morale and ethical intuition of a Western mind. This psychological paradigm is so fundamental and inherent to the Western ethos that even the most deviant philosophers, such as Friedrich Nietzsche for example, couldn't think outside the box of socialism including famous postmodern thinkers whom Spengler doesn't mention as he lived in the first half of the 20th century. Now we need a little primer in Spenglerian ontology to grasp his conception of socialism. Spengler views civilizations as living organisms with a lifespan and a destiny, similar to plants. Being inspired by the methods of Gerthian science, Spengler adopts morphological standing and takes every culture to be imbued by an earth symbol that is a prime symbol that is unique to each culture and that manifests itself in the curse of the flowering and the downfall of every civilization. He takes boundless space to be a defining prime symbol of Western culture, which he refers to as a Faustian culture. Faustian man differs from all others in his insatiable will to reach the infinite. He seeks to overcome with his telescope the dimensions of the universe and the dimensions of the earth with his wires and iron tracks. With his machines he sets out to conquer nature. He uses his historical thinking to take hold of the past and integrate it into his own existence under the name of world history. With his long-range weapons he seeks to subdue the entire planet including the remains of older cultures, forcing them to conform to his own way of life. Faust is a character from Goethe's epic poem who exchanges his soul for infinite knowledge and experience, a person of high intellect and erudition, 
who is always insatiable and seeks to look into the depths of the universe and get the taste of everything he could ever get his hands on, even if it could result in a moral downfall. Now, the significance of Spengler's analysis as someone who is undeniably blessed with an outstanding intuition of grasping the gist of different cultures and seeing them as a whole rather than isolated fragments of historical events offers us an insight into the heart of the Western culture, which is perhaps more intricate and rich than a circulating formula which states that Western culture is just a fruitful synthesis of Judeo-Christian values and Greek reason. Surely I'm not frowning upon this understanding as it has a noteworthy truth in it, but it would at least be justified to delve into greater depth when trying to account for the qualitative immensity of the West. Uh, the very West that I start to notice gets stuck in lots of people's throats. While growing up in a post-Soviet space, it always sparked interest in me as to what made lots of people so passive-aggressive about this thing that they ominously call the West. Returning to the morale of the West, Spengler accuses the West of living under the influence of immense optical illusion and linguistic confusion over its ethical foundations. An illusion that arises by the contradiction between concepts of good and evil, virtue and vice, compassion and charity, concepts that are supposed to be inherently of Christian origin, and the cultural morale of the Faustian man, which stands in contradiction to those principles. The cultural morale, then, of the Western ethos is exemplified by its reformulation of the thou shalt, which stands for a conviction that so-and-so must and can be changed. A feeling that one's understanding, or rather a sense of what constitutes the truth and objective reality should and has to prevail. A strong sense of modeling and reshaping the world in accordance with one's convictions and unshakable orders that follow from them. That, and the nothing short of it, is for us morale. In the ethics of the West, everything is direction, claim to power, will to affect the distant. Here, Luther is completely at one with Nietzsche, popes with Darwinians, socialists with Jesuits. For one and all, the beginning of morale is a claim to general and permanent validity. It is a necessity of the Faustian soul that this should be so. He who thinks or teaches otherwise is sinful, a backslider, a foe, and he is fought down without mercy. You shall, the state shall, society shall. Now upon hearing a statement like this where the West is accused of being a fundamentally universalist and of evangelist type, irrespective of whether its representatives are philosophers or religious missionaries in this case, one naturally questions its uniqueness to Western culture. After all, though Schalt and the formulas of shaping society according to a given belief system remind us of biblical teachings rather than an ethos of the Western culture. Well, Spengler challenges this intuition and claims that neither Christianity nor any other culture, including classical Greek, India or China, ever had the same morale which would satisfy his criteria of socialism. Buddha, for instance, gives a pattern to take or to leave, and Epicurus offers counsel. Both undeniably are forms of high morale and neither contains the will element. Hence, the defining world feeling of socialism is a will to carry out its own views on behalf of all. Therefore, every world improver is a socialist par excellence, and thus there are no world improvers in other cultures. For comparison, let's take Plato's Republic, where he lays out what he views to be the justice system of government. Uh, this work was criticized a number of times by Western thinkers. But the interesting thing here is the content of criticism. Namely, the Western mind was dissatisfied by the practical inapplicability and utopian nature of Plato's Republic, thus judging it to be a bug of Plato's outlook. However, that would be a form of Spenglerian projection, where a Western intellectual would evaluate other forms of work using its own standards, namely how theory can be put into practice. But a close inspection will show that Greeks never had the same notion of practical applicability, and Plato was well aware that his conception of the Republic might never be realized in real life. But that was never a purpose in the first place. The very beauty and theoretical truthfulness of the Republic were enough for a Greek sense. Thus, its inapplicability is a feature, not a bug. The very fact that Plato, in his other major work, The Laws, provides a more practical alternative to the Republic further demonstrates his awareness with respect to his philosophical project. 
Spengler also draws a notable contrast between Nietzsche and his Zarathustra and Greek philosophical schools. Nietzsche being a socialist was exclusive in his thinking. When he speaks about humanity, he conceives everyone, not just German people. Whereas when Greek philosophers spoke of humans, they meant Greek citizens who resided in the polis as opposed to barbarians. Yahweh, on the other hand, talks to his chosen people, the Israelites, and is presented a number of times as a god of the people of Israel. The Faustian ethos, on the other hand, holds that everything has to find a place in space and time. Gene Gebzer, another great cultural physician, states, It is a characteristic of the European to be dissatisfied with the mere knowledge of a fact or an event. He must also locate them in time or place, since without such location they have no real conceptual value for him. In other words, for the Western mind, nothing is purely theoretical. Even Descartes, Leibniz and Spinoza's most abstract theories retain an instrumental and practical ethos. They are all infused with technological and instrumental reasoning. Spengler interprets Kant's claim that space and time are a priori forms of intuition as culturally restricted to the Western mentality. When Plato speaks of humanity, he means the Hellens, in contrast to the barbarians. When, however, Kant philosophizes, say, on ethical ideas, he maintains the validity of his thesis for men of all times and places. He doesn't say this in so many words for he himself and his readers, it is something that goes without saying. In his aesthetics, he formulates the principles not of Phidias art or Rembrandt's art, but of art generally. But what he poses as necessary forms of thought are in reality only necessary forms of Western thought, though a glance at Aristotle and his essentially different conclusions should have sufficed to show that Aristotle's intellect, not less penetrating than his own, was of different structure from it. The categories of the Westerner are just as alien to Russian thought as those of the Chinaman or the ancient Greek are to him. As a result, Kant's view of the subject as the center of transcendent sphere of effect is essentially socialistic. He inquires, what is a man? The universalist tone of this question, where man could mean every single human, proves the point. Kant's reformulation of Christian compassion into a categorical imperative also demonstrates how Faustian man appropriates his ancestral past to his world feeling. The head of moral modernity, Kant excludes from his ethics the motive of compassion and lays down the formula, act so that. All ethic in this style expresses the will to infinity, and this will demands conquest of the moment, the present, and the foreground of life. In place of the Socratic formula, knowledge is virtue, we have even in Bacon the formula, knowledge is power. The Stoic takes the world as he finds it, but the Socialist wants to organize and recast it in form and substance, to fill it with his own spirit. The Socialist would have the whole world bear the form of his view, thus transferring the idea of the critique of pure reason into the ethical field. This is the ultimate meaning of the categorical imperative, which he brings to bear in political, social and economic matters alike. Act as though the maxims that you practice were to become by your will the law for all. And this tyrannical tendency is not absent from even the shallowest phenomena of the time. Although Nietzsche admired Greek culture, his worldview is utterly unclassical, since his Zarathustra is a world improver who aims to reform the world. He wants to see humanity according to his will, and everyone who stands in his path is a foe and an impediment. In other words, plurality as such is impossible for a Western mind, whereas in Greeks, Epicureans, Cynics and Stoics peacefully coexisted, even though they were opposing schools of thought. Also, Spengler neglects to highlight that Marcus Aurelius personally supported the Epicurean school, whose ideas were diametrically opposed to Stoicism. Epicurus, on the contrary, was heartily indifferent to others' opinions and acts, and never wasted one thought on the transformation of mankind. He and his friends were content that they were as they were, and not otherwise. The classical ideal was indifference, apatheia, to the curse of the world, the very thing which it is the whole business of Faustian mankind to master, and an important element of both of Stoic and of Epicurean philosophy was the recognition of a category of things neither preferred nor rejected. What about Christianity, one might wonder? 
Spengler states that it was not Christianity that transformed Faustian men, but Faustian men who transformed Christianity. And he not only made it a new religion, but also gave it a new moral direction. The new moral direction that Spengler is talking about is will to power, will to transform and will to reshape the world according to one's convictions, which were completely alien to Jesus' teachings. For example, in Matthew 11:15, Jesus says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Evidently, there is no claim to power in these words. However, the Western Church never conceived its mission thus. Upon criticizing Nietzsche's conception of the slave morale, Spengler questions if Christian-type compassion ever existed on Western soil. And where on the heights of Faustian morale, from the Crusades to the World War, do we find anything of the slave morale? The meek resignation, the deaconess of Caritas. Only in pious and honored words, nowhere else. The type of the very priesthood is Faustian. Think of those magnificent bishops of the old German Empire who on horseback led their flocks into the wild battle, or those popes who could force submission on a Henry IV and Friedrich II, of the Teutonic Knights in the Ostmark, of Luther's challenge in which the old northern heathendom rose up against old Roman, of the great cardinals who shaped France. That is Faustian morale. The fundamental difference between Western missionary ethos and Christian ethos is the mode of presentation. In Magian culture, which for Spengler encompasses Persian and Judeo-Christian cultures, preaching was understood as a mystic benefit that was to be displayed but never imposed. Thus for the Magian spirit, Gospels are good news, but for the Faustian world feeling, it is a new world order that must be officiated. He contrasts this difference by comparing Western physicians to Magian ones. The latter merely proclaimed the virtues of this mysterious arcana, whereas the medical men of the West are inherently political as they seek the force of civil law. In other words, Western medical sense always translates its knowledge into public order and civil regulations. Thus there was an inward transformation of the morale of Jesus, a morale or conduct recommended as potent for salvation, a morale the knowledge of which was communicated as a special act of grace, was recast as a morale of imperative command. This process of a culture remodeling ancestral tradition to fit its world feeling is best shown in Goethe's Faust, when Faust in his Gothic chamber was translating the Gospel of John. The first sentence of the Gospel states, that in the beginning was the word Logos. Now Faust, as a representation of the Western spirit of directional willpower, is hesitant to translate word in its original form, since the mere word doesn't resonate with him. And as he says himself, it would be foolish for him to rate the word so highly. I must translate it in a different sense. Now if the spirit guides me right, I ought to say, in the beginning there was thought. Consider well the deeper truth escapes the hasty pen, for is it thought that shapes and drives creation at its very source? Far better, in the beginning was the force. Yet something tells me, even as I write, that this is not the meaning that I need. The spirit helps me. Now I see the light. I have it. In the beginning was the deed. Although Spengler doesn't quote Faust when discussing Western socialism, it is apparent that the concept of deed that Spengler uses to characterize the morale of a Faustian culture is inextricably linked with this passage. In other translations, the German word tat appears as act rather than deed. It is no accident that Spengler also takes the word activity to be culturally loaded as well. Given that neither Greek nor Latin has to offer exact equivalence of these words action and activity, it becomes clear that Western ethos is of different temperament and is imbued with directional willpower of incessant activity. For the Faustian eyes, everything is motion with an aim. Now the first attempt of Faust to translate the word as thought also appears as a sense in other translations. The second attempt, a force, also appears as power, and the third already mentioned is deed, also translated as act. The takeaway here is that the western spirit is restless and full of motion, where everything must eventually find a practical realization, beginning with thought and sense moving to the force and power necessary to bring the abstract thought into execution, and finally to present it as a deed of universal importance.
Uh, this trinity evolving from thought to deed will be repeated by the actions of Faust, which I will not spoil for you if you haven't read this masterpiece yet. Now, for Spangler, words have defining meanings for cultures, as different civilizations have their representative words, which saturate their spirit. At the base of every culture lies an idea that is expressed by certain words of profound significance. In Chinese culture, these words are Tao and Li. For the Apollinian Greeks, this cultural idea was contained in the world's logos. In the languages of Faustian men, the basic cultural idea is expressed by the words will, strength, and space. Spengler draws a further distinction between classical Greece and the West by pointing to the peaceful coexistence of Ionic and Corinthian styles alongside Doric without any claim to the soul and general validity, whereas every act of creativity in the Western ethos is a form of transformation and destruction of the previous one. Renaissance expelled the Gothic and Classicism expelled the Baroque styles, and the history of every European literature is filled with battles over form problems. Even our monasticism with its Templars, Franciscans, Dominicans, and the rest takes shape as an order movement, in sharp contrast to the ascesis of the early Christian hermit. Thus, the concepts like reformation, reaction, construction, reconstruction, destruction, and deconstruction are completely unclassical and have an innately Western feel to them. Western philosophers, for example, are paradigmatically reactionary and always advocate for the rebuilding of our thinking, regardless of how far beyond good and evil one might consider himself. It makes no difference how Nietzsche, Heidegger, Foucault, Derrida, or any other philosopher, including Spengler, attempted to think outside the existing paradigm. They're still acting out the socialistic ethos of the Faustian will to change and reconstruct. The very act and desire to break free from the a priori metaphysical paradigm is circular in nature, as the desire of breaking free is a Faustian ethos. Thus, Spengler's selection of boundless space as the prime symbol of the West manifests itself in every aspect of its existence. Thus, the philosophers mentioned above are still described as revolutionaries and conceived as representing epical turning points. All the major 20th century intellectual milestones were understood in a politico-religious sense. For example, the cognitive revolution, the linguistic revolution, the scientific revolution, or the graphic revolution, and so on. The reason for this is that no matter how avant-garde, posh, and elitist one's philosophical taste is, Western ethos never resists the urge to conceive its present living as a revolutionary turning point that will produce a massive change. Even intellectual debates are viewed as a warfare, where one must triumph over his foe, as if it is a mortal combat or something of that sort, where an intellectual has to deliver a fatality in his closing statement. The conflict between post-structuralist philosophers and natural scientists, for example, is referred to as science wars. The debate between Leonard Susskind and Stephen Hawking regarding black holes was reported as a clash of titans. Remember the four horsemen of atheism? Mighty revolutionaries who waged war against irrationality and Christian dogma. The emotions with which we, former teenagers, were invested and cheered for our intellectual heroes to decapitate their opponents. And that's the irony that Spengler points to. As for example, Nietzsche conceived lightness and the ability to resist the spirit of gravity to be of primary importance. He said, I can only believe in God who is able to dance. However, he, like his father who was a priest, never acted it out and still was a revolutionary of a metaphysical seriousness, declaring the death of God and the transvaluation of all values. Thus, every moment means to win, while every classical attitude only wants to be and troubles itself little about the ethos of the neighbor. Here we get to the fundamental difference between Greek, I Sophoclean, and Western, I Shakespearean tragedy. On the one hand, we have a man who only wants to exist, and on the other, a man who wants to win. Now, because Pengler has an essentialist understanding of the morale, he doesn't believe that there is such thing as an actual transformation or change. Philosophical and ideological differences are a matter of taste and style for him. Spengler maintains that it makes no difference whether we adopt a supposed atheism, neo-spiritualism, paganism, communism, or any other religion. All these are mere alterations of words and concepts, 
as the morale of the will to change, will to transform and negate the opposite, is something inherent and universal that binds every ideology in a unifying principle of socialism. Now, I think that Spengler's critique of change and the notion of his apocalyptic transformation, whether viewed on a personal or a political level, is noteworthy. In my video about spirituality, I discussed how the supposed transformations of famous atheists were of superficial nature, as lots of them were fundamentalist Christians and preachers. Also, a viewer expressed his dissatisfaction with spiritual people in the video's comment section. He specifically mentioned how annoying and commanding they were. That is undoubtedly another point for Spengler, because regardless of Western men's ethos, the need to display oneself and influence others in an evangelistic manner appears to have profound psychological roots. Thus, ethical socialism is a sentiment of action at a distance, which comes from the root feeling of care, care for those who are with us and for those who are to follow. As an example, in his book, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins, one of the modern prime examples of Spenglerian understanding of Faustian socialism and universalism, writes, Let me sum up Einsteinian religion in one more quotation from Einstein himself. To sense that behind anything that can be experienced, there is something that our mind cannot grasp and whose beauty and sublimity reaches us only indirectly and is a feeble reflection, this is religiousness, in the sense I am religious. In the opening of his book, he discusses the Einsteinian religion, to which he clearly subscribes. He, as a devoted Einsteinian, also defends against the misinterpretations of this Einsteinian religion and clarifies what it actually means. Now, the significance of Dawkins's Einsteinianism, if you will, has to do with its connection with Spenglerian socialism. Nowhere in the philosophy or doctrine of Einsteinianism which stems from Spinoza's understanding of God, is evangelism explicitly demanded. In other words, why on the earth would you engage in converting people to the religion of Einsteinism, irrespective of how rational it might be? As a matter of fact, the awe and wonder with which Dawkins treats the natural world, which I greatly respect, by the way, is not rational in and of itself. The sense of spiritual fulfillment coming from the scientific investigation comes from emotional and deeply spiritual ethos. However, Dawkins coming from an evangelist background is very adamant in claiming the universal validity of his world feeling, which is socialism par excellence. Uh, the irrationality of this impulse to spread the truth, in Dawkins's case, lies in the contradictory nature of his worldview. However, note that when it comes to someone's inner spiritual yearnings, contradiction is never an issue. What I'm referring to is Dawkins' claim that he's an elitist. Namely, he's a proponent of meritocracy, believing that those with high-level expertise should hold positions of power, beginning from airplane pilots up to politicians. However, it never occurred to him that maybe Einsteinianism, nature's wonder or the awe he feels during scientific investigation might not be as universal and applicable to everyone else as he assumes it to be. Perhaps not everyone can adopt and gain the same spiritual fulfillment by adopting a scientific worldview. But it is socialism at its finest, where you believe you can alter people's brains according to your convictions. Thus, continuing the point of Spengler, if Luther is at one with Nietzsche, Pope's with Darwinians, socialists with Jesuits, then Dawkins is at one with Peterson, young earth creationist with Neil deGrasse Tyson, communist with capitalists, and so on and so forth. The example of young earth creationists might be irritating, as in this case we're dealing with an objectively false worldview, however, the Faustian will to affect the distance, to change how humans think, to reveal the truth to everyone, is universal amongst all of them. 12 rules for life. Well, 12 rules for whose life? Is it equally applicable to all social classes, to every ethnicity, to every culture? Are they truly that abstract enough to have the title of life? Can a man from Uzbekistan, let's say, appropriate those principles with the same fervor as a Westerner? For the closing of the video, I want to stress Spengler's points of universal validity, 
where a person of deeply socialistic tendency would always regard a slight deviation from his worldview to be catastrophic, since pluralism is somehow impossible in the Western intellectual discourse. This reminds me of a popular anecdote about religion, which goes like this. Once I saw this guy on a bridge about to jump. I said, don't do it. He said, nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yes. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, a Christian. I said, me too. Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. I said, me too. What franchise? He said, Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He said, Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region or Northern Conservative Baptist Eastern Region? He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region. I said, me too. Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He said, Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. I said, die heretic, and I pushed him over. Uh, thus, <laughs> uh, thus, here are the major four points from this video. First, Schopenhauer marks the point at which metaphysics dies, and the Western Faustian deed with the aim and directional energy transforms into work, which defines the modern United States. If we continue Spengler's practice of attaching specific words to specific cultures, then hard work would be the best suit for America. Schopenhauer is to blame here because he is the first to conceive the whole existence as will and redefine the mind as a brain. Thus, from deed to work and from mind to brain, Western socialism transforms into a deficient mode of aimless work and quantitative globalization as opposed to qualitative globalization. Second, Spengler's understanding of the concept of socialism invites us to think about major civilizations holistically and look into the inner workings of different psychological temperaments. If one finds enough powers to step back from the hyper-focused mode and zoom out from his daily existence, he will be able to identify general patterns that connect seemingly different and opposing thinkers and social processes. Unfortunately, nowadays all of us live in the modality and mind of a Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lake Regions Council of 1879, comprising one half of the universe. Whereas the Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lake Regions Council of 1912 is the other half that needs to be destroyed. Thus, if one wishes to have a comprehensive vision of his life, it is sometimes more useful to ponder similarities than differences between things. The ability to step back and evaluate seemingly disparate historical events in a comprehensive and holistic manner allows us to break free from the modern worldview of hyper-specialization, which has become intellectually toxic and self-destructive. Fourth, Western culture, like every other great civilization, has its own distinct identity and unique flair to it. Thus, the notion that there is no such thing as the culture, just because practices and traditions have changed over time, is incredibly short-sighted and blind to the larger picture. Further, the West is more than just a nice concoction of Greek reason and Judeo-Christian values. There is something unique and distinct about it that deserves proper attention. And finally, I want to say a word or two about the purpose of this video. Because Spengler has a very aggressive mode of presentation as he's a Westerner too, one might think that this carries an anti-Western sentiment. Quite the contrary, knowing oneself, even when it is presented in a harsh manner, is indispensable. Most of the insights that I can boast come from the Western minds. I'm certain that when it comes to explaining the ethos and substance of this magnificent civilization, Western culture is not given a fair shake. And regardless of his political views, I feel that holistic author like Spengler is a good place to start in an endeavor to discern intracultural commonalities of a specific culture as opposed to internal contradictions, and to observe intercultural contrast as opposed to commonalities. As a result, I might make another video about a general introduction to Spengler's method and philosophy. As always, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to my Patreons are supporting me and making sure that the channel goes on. If you want to support me, you can become a Patreon too. You can find the links in the description. 
Also, I want to hear your thoughts about Western temperament and what are your opinions about it.